Ladies and gentlemen, you have waited all week. Yeah, Boogie yeah. Page. Hey, hey, hey. Throwing it down for things BMX is ready. ready. I know I am. Check the ATB Airways. Welcome to the All Things BMX Show. We're on episode 169. Tonight is gold medal. We got Connor Fields joining us. Connor's a three time Olympian. Do you know that, Chris? Yes. He did because it's I in the show notes. I did. <laughs> yeah, I cheated. Multi time no. world champion. And you know what? We could go on and on with the accolades. We're just going to let him tell us about it tonight. Yep. And uh, we're looking for a fun time tonight. Uh, ATB Crew is coming to you from the ATB Studios here in Heartland, Michigan. We appreciate you guys joining us this evening. Chat rooms are filling up. Viewers are logging in right now. We appreciate it. Like and subscribe, all that fun stuff. Always, always. And, and uh, the show doesn't happen without the support and sponsors of the good people over at Gate 9 Design, BMX Rocks Photography, and our good friends at 110 Nutrition Answer and Bomb Show. We appreciate it, you guys. And uh, without any further ado, let's bring our guest in. Let's get going here. Connor, how's it going? What's going on? Thanks for having me. Hey, wel welcome into the show, Connor. All right, so let's just get rolling here. How did you get involved or find out about the sport of BMX racing? Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I, like most kids, learned how to ride a bike, I think around the age of six. And I loved riding my bike. I would jump off the curbs and just pop wheelies and all that. And uh, one day, my mom took me and my bike to the bike shop. I think I might have had a flat tire or something. And my mom found a flyer advertising the local BMX track. And it was advertising Nellis BMX, which is still there today. And thought to herself that maybe I would like it. <clears throat> so that next weekend, we went and we watched some of the races. And I really wanted to try it. So the following weekend, we came back and brought my bike. And I tried it. And here we are. Wow. <laughs> Six years old. Here we are. That's so humble. <laughs> yeah. And Your career is outstanding. Yes. I, guess. I mean, it's, yeah. it's interesting looking back at that time because myself and anybody who got involved in the sport, a lot of the opportunities that the athletes today have were not around. You know, BMX was not in the Olympics yet. They didn't have college scholarships available for it yet. Um, it was a total passion based sport and you did it because you just liked it. You wanted to do it. Um, and you know, I played other sports until I was 10, 11 years old. And at that point in time, I kind of decided that I would rather ride BMX and didn't really want to play T-ball anymore. <laughs> so awesome. so how, how long before you had your first uh, sponsor, a bike shop, I'm guessing? Um, 
There was a local team when I was about eight years old, a uh, local team here from Vegas called Bad Boys. And they competed at the national level. And this is a million years ago. This is back in the NBL days. And Vegas was an NBL town. Um, so they were an NBL team. And they had a bunch of the, the top local riders and then a, a handful of riders from neighboring states. I think Ariel Martin rode for Bad Boys. She was from Utah. Um, yeah. Yeah. and then a couple of people from California and that was my first team. Ah. So, so it kind of took off from there eh? with the, the sponsor yeah. team and sponsorship type stuff. So who was your first, uh, big sponsor? You know, I mean, obviously you're with chase now, but before that. So after I rode the bad boys for a couple of years, I rode for the team at the time was answer pro concept. And that was when I was 10 years old. Uh, that was when I switched over to start racing ABA. Um, you know, that team had a ton of really, really talented riders. David Herman, 2012 Olympian, rode for them. Chris Fox, who's a professional freestyle rider, rode for them. Travis Rosda, Jared Garcia, you know, a bunch of really talented riders rode for them. I rode for them for a couple of years. Um, and then I had a period of time in my teenage years, like 13 to 15, where I didn't have a sponsor, uh, didn't have a, I just had some support, but I wasn't on a team or anything. And then, um, I was picked up. I started to get fast again. Um, when I was 15, I was picked up by Phantom on track, which was Donovan Long's team at the time. Um, and I rode for them when I was 15 and 16. And then I signed with a free agent, which at the time, was Mara Strombergs, Kyle Bennett, and Christian Besserine. And then they sponsored me as an amateur. And the, the goal at, at that time was I was going to ride for free agent for a few years as an amateur. And then when Christian and Kyle were kind of ready to retire and they're at that age, I was going to kind of be like a developmental rider and ready to slot into the pro class. Okay. Um, but what ended up happening was I got better so much faster than expected and turned pro a lot sooner than everybody expected. And they couldn't afford a fourth pro. Um, so that was when I linked up with Chase, which at the time wasn't even a thing. Um, it was just an idea. And I cast a vote on what they were gonna name the brand. It was between Chase and something else. So I've been there since literally day number one. Um, oh. And I signed with them, that was 2011, which was also my first year as an elite. And then I've uh, been with Chase ever since. Wow. That's so awesome. That, that, that's cool that you've been there since day one. So you, you've been, so you get involved in some of the, like the frame design development, that type of thing. You get involved? To an extent. Uh, they've got a great team of people with uh, Christoph Lebeck, who owns a brand, who's a past champion himself. And then Pete Deluski, who's been around the sport forever. And then Max T, um, he is the product designer. And he's always made great products. And he's asked me some questions a few times mm -hmm. and asked for some input or asked me to test products and let him know what I think. Um, but to be honest, they really have done a good job of creating race-ready products that they just send me. They would show up at the door, and I would trust that they were good to go. Good to go. Eh? Okay. So th there's no, like, special Connor Fields frame or any of that type of stuff? You just run the stock stuff? Nope. Everything I rode, other than my pedals, was completely stock. Um, I had custom pedals that were tighter to avoid unclipping, but other than that, everything was completely stock. Okay. So everybody can go buy the same stuff you run? Yep. Just go to, was it, brg.com? <laughs> BRG, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Cool deal, man. When you when you had started and you were working your way up, <clears throat> like uh, – when you were back on the Phantom on track team, I remember you guys, uh, man, that was a stack team. And it seems you've been on stack teams. Did you foresee yourself being Olympic gold medalist, the pro you've, you are now, was that always in your sights? Um, even back then? Yes. And no, okay. I think I always had that dream and that goal. And I, I always had the drive. Like it was never a question if I was willing to put in the work. Um, but there was a period of time when I, I guess the, the biggest question was if I was good enough for the talent, 
between the ages of like 12 and 15, I was kind of on that bubble of being like a main maker. Like I think I would be ranging between like nag five and nag 10 every year. Um, and I would always work really hard, but I just wasn't big enough. Really. It was the thing I, I grew later. And so a lot of the other riders in my age, they kind of went through puberty and then and you see it all the time when you see two 14 year olds, a lot of times one 14 year old will look like a young man. And another 14 year old look like a little boy. So true. Um, right. <laughs> yep, so true. And I was, I was the late bloomer. And so I could work as hard as I wanted, but I'm going against guys with mustaches. And there's, <laughs> there's no amount of sprints I could do to make up for the, the lack of testosterone that I had. Fair. And uh, yeah. really what happened was when I grew, um, I had already laid this foundation of putting in the work and, you know, fighting for every inch and figuring out ways that I could beat the other riders uh, that didn't involve strength. So it was more skill-based, strategy-based stuff. So then when I grew and now we were all on a level playing field, it was on. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> that is it. So I didn't, I didn't win nag one for the first time until I was 16. 16 X was the first time I won nag one. Um, my age was Do Corbin Sherrod dominated our age group growing up and won the vast majority of the nag ones when we were growing up. Oh, so, so you guys are the same age. So you're always going going back and forth with each other probably eh? it wasn't much going back and forth it was Corbin <laughs> pretty much dominating me until we were 16 and then I finally started to get some some action and then uh right but I I really credit chasing him around as a kid to a lot of the success because he's so talented he's so fast and um you know he was not not a, an easy competitor to have to race against and it really forced me to figure out a way to beat him which paid off in the long run yeah, that, that's something I, I, you know, when, when we're out at the track and you'll hear, you know, a, a parent or a kid saying, oh, you know, my, my 13 year old now has to race the 15 or 16 year old. I'm like, well, it's not that bad. You know, it's a local race. It's not that bad. Plus, they're going to learn something, even if they are behind them following the older kid. They're going to learn something from that. They're going to see things. They're going to learn things they didn't know. You learn more losing than you learn winning. I like that. <clears throat> I'm stealing that. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you're into a lot of other things other than BMX, and uh, we kind of want to touch on those things before uh, we we wrap this evening. But uh, first thing I wanted to make sure we get into is you've got the program uh, going on in in the sport right now, the CFP, the Cash for Podium. And uh, can you take a few minutes and explain that to everybody, what you've put together with that program and, and the people you have helping you with that? Yeah, yeah, sure, for sure. So um, I actually struck a, a deal with ODI in 2019 that we were going to do a signature grip. And um, ODI has got signature grips with a ton of athletes across different disciplines of cycling. You know, Aaron Gwynn in mountain bike, Mike Hucker in freestyle, a tanker war as a whole bunch of different athletes. Uh, but the only one that they have ever done at BMX racing was with Mara Stromberg's and it was just a limited run. It wasn't um, a long-term thing. So they decided that they wanted to do the first, you know, long-term signature product in BMX racing and then COVID hit and everything got delayed oh, and oh all the supply chain and all that. So it ended up taking like two and a half years longer than we wanted it to um but then when we when we finally got it all going you know we were trying to figure out uh, and this was my goal from the start was how can we do something cool to help the next generation and because and help inspire them and support them as they go on their own olympic journey uh, i wouldn't have had the success that i had had i not had great people in my corner um to teach me and to help me and so, you know, figuring out what I wanted to do, I wanted to figure out how to, you know, inspire and help this next generation. And that's both financially as well as with advice and, and information. Um, so I devised this program where we're giving bonuses out for podiums at the UCI rounds, uh, which is Sunday at the pro races for junior elite and U23 men and women. And I, um, 
in addition to giving them money for a podium finish if they run the the grip all of them have my information and i've let them all know that they can reach out if they have any questions and a number of them have they've emailed me with training questions they've emailed me with advice about sponsorship you know how to make the national team how to make the funded team at the worlds you know things like that and so i'm you know helping pass on the knowledge and the information that i learned which is um pretty fun and then in addition to that you know simple stuff like i'm teaching them if they want to get paid they have to fill out an invoice and submit an invoice alongside a <laughs> picture of them on the podium to you know prove it not that i think they're lying but you know when you get to the higher levels when i'm in when i was invoicing chase or monster energy or ralph Lauren for a podium finish you have to submit a professional invoice with a photo of you on the podium holding your monster can to prove that you did your job if you want them to give you your bonus. Mm-hmm. So just right. teaching them a little bit of the business side of it as well as they make the transition from amateur to pro, which is something that there's really not any resources out there to help those athletes as they transition from racing for saver stamps to racing to pay their rent, which is huh? you know a huge difference. Oh, there's got to be a huge learning curve there. I mean, if there was no one to teach yourself that, you just have to figure it out. Yeah, or you either have to figure it out or you don't, and you real life takes over, and you realize that, you know, maybe this isn't for you, and you give up before it's you know, yep. been enough time for you to really have a proper crack at it. How did, how did you learn? I was very lucky because the first team that I was on with free agent, I was on a team with Maris Stromberg, Kyle Bennett, and Christian Bessery. So I was able to look at what they were doing. Now, as an example, the first race I showed up at when I was 17 years old, I walked into the pit and all of them had gallon water jugs. And then they all had their own little bag with food. You know, some of them had sandwich stuff, bananas, power bars, whatever they had. And, you know, I'm 16 expert. I'm just going to get nacho. Was nacho stand, right? <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I get to the race and I see that this is what they're doing. They've all got their supplements. They've got their uh, electrolytes. They've got their protein. <clears throat> and I'm watching what they're doing. And I'm asking them, you know, what is that? What is that? What is that? And the next race I showed up, I brought my gallon water jug and my bag with my food in it. You know, yeah. and just kind of picking up from what I learned from them. And then not only that, but just asking because every pro was once an amateur. And every pro had somebody help them. And so if you ask, they'll tell you, you know, it's no different, not just in BMX and any, and any aspect of life. Most of the time, people who are successful are happy to pass forward the knowledge that they've learned. But a lot of times people don't ask, which blows my mind. Like nobody has ever come up to me and asked certain questions and I don't understand why. Um, Yeah. But those guys taught me a lot. And then I also had great coaching. Um, I was worked. I worked with my longtime coach. I started working with him when I was 18 years old, and he worked with Kyle Bennett before me, and a lot of other you know great athletes, Kaylin Young, etc. And you know he was able to help guide me through some of the transitions. Nice. That is cool. And it's nice to see that you're passing this along too. Uh, do you provide the coaching part? You kind of touched on a little bit. Uh, do you provide that for uh, racers? And I, I know you do your clinics. Do you provide like a one-on-one for for riders? Yeah, so I do my clinics, and then really right now the only two riders that I'm doing one-on-one with is Joey Lito and Ethan Popovich. And the reason that I do it with those two is because I like those two. They're friends of mine, mm-hmm. um, and I also believe that both of them have the talent, the work ethic to go the distance. And so, you know, I'm, I'm willing to help them out specifically. Um, maybe in the future, I would open up and be w- willing and able to coach more. But right now, I'm, I'm real busy. I've got a lot going on. And um, for me to, to do it, I want to do it properly. And I don't want to have too many people and not be able to give everybody the attention that they deserve. Mm. I want to be able to, you know, give them 100% and not feel like I'm – cut them short at all so for now it's just those two right on that makes sense you've also got some stuff going on outside of bmx also with um i see you on linkedin a lot with your speaking um 
and we've got a couple uh, pictures that pop up in the slideshow that are running too. Um, you care to explain, uh, kind of give us a little insight on what uh, what that is and um, how if somebody was interested in having you come and speak, how they could get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, if somebody was interested in having me come and speak, you just feel free to reach out via my website. Um, my contact's on there. You can just email me. It's really easy. It's Connor at ConnorFields.com. Um, but basically, a lot of companies and businesses and even schools, so I'm speaking for my old college at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, for their athletic department um, as they come back to the school year. I'm speaking to them on goal setting and resiliency. Um, but a lot of businesses, schools, organizations will have their annual conference or they'll have their quarterly meetings or whatever it is. And uh, they'll look to bring somebody in to, to teach their employees about a specific thing, whether it's resiliency, whether it's uh, goal setting, whether it's mental health, you know, whether it's how to, you know, push through adversity, you know, whatever it may be. And I go in and share stories and, and share what I've learned. Um, kind of no different than paying it forward to the BMX racers, but just help people through my story and what I've experienced. Very oh, cool. That is cool. <clears throat> What's been the most interesting group you've talked to? <laughs> Ooh. That's a good question. Um, I'll tell you the answer to that one. So I did a volunteer one. I spoke to an organization called Hope for Prisoners. And it's an organization here in my hometown, which takes uh, ex-convicts and people after getting out of jail and helps them assimilate back into, um, I guess, you know, the normal world after being in jail. And I remember being so nervous to speak to them because, you know, there's a bunch of hardened and tough people who have just gone out of jail. And what are they going to have in common with someone whose biggest issue for a long time was not winning a BMX race. <laughs> right? And so I was pretty nervous for a while. And then I spoke to them and they were one of the best audiences I've ever had. And they were so thankful and appreciative. And uh, it was a good lesson for me not to, to judge a book by its cover and really to, you know, everybody's just people. Everybody just wants to be better. And, uh, but that was one of the most nervous I've ever been. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Understood. <laughs> yeah. And how cool was it? Uh, I'm going to switch topics. Your grips were on the bike that uh, Dark Fest did the 100. Was it 110, 120 foot backflip? Yeah, it's on my stid. Yeah, I had no idea either. Um, I found out because somebody messaged me and said the world record backflip was using your grips and. So I reached out to the dude on Instagram and I congratulated him and I said, Hey, you've got a lifetime supply. Anytime you need some, just let me know. <laughs> that was that cool. That is sweet. Insane. Man. It's been, I tell you one of the coolest things about it is that I created something that I liked and to see, obviously grips are very personal, right? Like everybody likes something yeah. different. Yeah. Everybody, um, you're particular. But to see a lot of the athletes choose and enjoy what I created is really cool. You know, Sean day won the world championships last week using them. Isaac Kennedy chooses to use them. Cameron Wood uses them. You know, a lot of really, really talented, amazing athletes choose to use them. And it's a really cool, uh, really cool feeling that they enjoy what I created. It's it's awesome seeing, you know, ODI, you know, with you, with the cash for podiums, with your grips. Um, just your the, the line you had for the grips and your autographs in Vegas at the National in February of, was it this year or last year? 21 21 20 holy shit yeah it was like almost out the door of the <laughs> arena <laughs> it really it's, was. it's 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 awesome. you know it's great to see that and um yeah. you know just to see that they're very actively involved in in bmx racing is really cool um so switching it up a little bit who's your favorite motocross racer uh well i'd have to say christian craig he's, <laughs> he's my friend he's a good homie of mine Thanks, <laughs> oh, really? racer. um He's awesome. And then I, I also like Eli Tomac. Mm -hmm. uh, he's another XBMX racer. His dad's in the Bicycle Hall of Fame. But, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I just I feel like the way Eli rides a motorcycle reminds me of the way that I rode a BMX bike, which, you know, there's absolutely no denying that he is giving it everything he has all the time. Uh -huh. Right. Like you look at somebody like a Jet Lawrence or a Christian Prager or Chase Sexton, they remind me of more of a Joris or a Corbin that smooth, relaxed, flowy style where you watch Eli and he looks like he's trying to just break the handlebars off that thing. And that's how I look at too. 
that's, that's, awesome. that's true. You, you don't realize that when you're watching it, but yeah, yeah. The, the, they all have a little bit different style to them, just like the, the BMX guys do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. So we, we had uh, Greg Harrison on the show last week, and he had heard that we were going to talk with you this week, and he had mentioned that we needed to really ask you uh, for some advice or, or some insight that you might have on uh, what does it take to, to have the right mindset to be a pro, especially in the BMX world? That's a long answer. So I'm not trying to <laughs> how to short it. The biggest thing that I'll say that I don't think that people understand or that maybe they underestimate as they're turning from amateur to pro is the level of commitment that you have to make. Right? So I was okay. on the phone um, with with Joey Lito yesterday. Oh yeah. And we were talking about Joris and like Joris has multiple kids. And Joris is paying for diapers based on how he performs at the races. Hmm. That's a good point. And when that's the mindset versus, you know, you're just there for some Insta clips and some TikTok videos, <laughs> it's a different ball game. Sure. And, you know, depending on what country you're from, you know, Maris Stromberg is on pension for the rest of his life from Latvia for winning that gold medal. Wow. Isn't that Mariana sad? is set for life for winning that gold medal. Yep. I mean, if you're if you're from a, a smaller country, you can set your family up for generations by performing at the Olympics. That's amazing. And so the the mindset that those athletes are going to have, that's what you're competing against. They will do anything to reach success. And I feel like a lot of the the amateurs these days don't understand the level of commitment that it takes and. You know, they're more worried about getting that whip video so that they can get 300 likes on Instagram, you know, or, or they don't understand that you can't just go and stay out late all weekend and, and drink beers and do all that. Like, sure, you can have a bit of fun at the right time, but it's a 24 hour a day job to, to reach the highest level. And, you know, also the other thing I'll say is, you're going to win more than, or sorry, you're going to lose more than you win, no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. No matter if you're the winningest rider of all time, you still lost more races than you've won. <laughs> and, and I think when you're looking at a lot of these amateurs who dominate and win 25 out of 28 races that they're in in a year, that doesn't happen in the pro class. Like you get, you just show up sometimes and get beat. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and a lot of times when, when the riders turn pro, they get beat down a couple times and then they can't handle losing. And they don't understand that that's just part of it. And there's some athletes, so like the photo on the screen right now is Jeremy Smith. Jeremy Smith is 28 years old. Jeremy won his first pro race this year. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Yep. He's been racing pro since 2016. I didn't know that. Wow. That's perspective for yeah. sure. There's a lot of pros who never win a race. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That, I, that, that's kind of humbling, you know, to, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but like that, that insight of, yeah, you, you're right. You know, when the last, the last person who won a USA BMX number one pro title, that wasn't me or George today was. Uh, uh, wasn't it Barry? Barry's never won a Not pro title. Oh, oh won sorry. Pro. He's never won a pro title. He won the, the, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah. no. It was 2014. 2014. Oh my gosh. 2014 was the last person that someone not named Connor or Joris won a pro title. Wow. Isn't that something? So okay. it's like, like basically what I'm getting at is like, you're going to lose more than you're going to win. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people, when they are amateur hot shots, they struggle with, the realization that it's not easy anymore and that everybody who's here was an amateur hot shot. Everybody who's here was nag one. Everybody who's here is talented and works hard. It's no longer, you know, cruise through motos, do a first straight in the quarter, maybe try a little bit in the semi. Okay. It's the main <laughs> event. Now I'm going to go. It's stack motos from moto one every time. Yeah. All the That's time. true. Okay. Who, who was it? Maris. I, I should have. 
That was my guess. I wasn't <laughs> sure, but that was a guess. <laughs> but, I mean, that was a long time ago. And Jordan yeah. is think far about and or something crazy happened. He's going to win again this year. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be almost 10 years that it's been since somebody else won. That's amazing. And and that's, you know, just how it goes. Yeah. And and you you're, you're going to lose a lot. That's just what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I I you, you don't think about that stuff like well, of course, I'm not a professional, so I I don't <laughs> look at it that way, but you know, but uh Well, that's why it's that's, impactful when you say you, you should be learning more or you recommend learning more from losing than winning. Yeah. What's the next step? What's pushing you to the next to be that next person up there? Yeah, hmm. this is a, yeah, that's, it's a lot of commitment, like Connor just said. So that's that's pretty. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, I don't know what <laughs> now else I know to why say. Greg suggested we ask you such a question. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that's good insight. Thank you. Yeah, and I, it's hard for it's hard to understand it unless you, you know, you're the athlete who's done it, or sure. you know someone like you're close to someone who's done it. Sure. Um, it's just yeah, you, you can't really describe just what it takes and the level of commitment and you know it's different from football basketball baseball where they have seasons and then they can go and take three four months off and and chill i mean after the grands you get two weeks off and then you're training you get two weeks off a year and then you're training again and you're racing first race of the years in february last race of the years in november and if you want to be a, a champion you got to be pulling all year yeah all the time and, that that means that you're missing your friends' birthday parties, you're missing weddings, you're sprinting on Christmas. Like, you know, there there's this uh, a, a totally different level of commitment that it takes um, when you're at that when you're at that level. You had mentioned earlier <clears throat> uh, about being an NBL uh, state. Did you ever do the Christmas Classic? Oh yeah! Do you see that cup? I think it's my own show. That's the Christmas Classic Cup from two thousand one. Yeah, man. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I, put my, I put my change in there now. When I come home with a pocket full of change, it just collects all my change. That's adorable. That's uh, we're well. We said before, and most people know we're out. We're out of Michigan, so that was a big, big race for us. Was the the Christmas Classic? Shoot, for most, it was sometimes the only national that uh, we did. It yeah. Was, that was a good yeah, time. that was a cool one. There's a lot of things about the NBL that were really cool. The state versus state battle. You'd show up in the jersey. And yep. That whole thing was really cool. And uh, the spring break things that they did in Florida. And um, yeah. Yeah, I, we were an NBL kid. Or I was an NBL kid because Vegas was an NBL city. And then um, I won the NBL, you know, their version of NAG won a couple of times. And then we decided to try ABA. And ABA at the time was a lot more competitive it was a lot harder mm -hmm. and sure. my dad loves this story this is one of my dad's favorite stories i was the nag one nine x for mbo and i drove down to southern california which at the time was the hotbed of bmx and i did a local race at uh, grand prix bmx by Redmond's trap and i got moto at a local race as the nag one. Oh wow yeah, <laughs> NBA kids. and i drove my dad drove home it was about three hours away my dad drove home and I cried the whole way home. <laughs> and my dad looked at me and he said, you can be a big fish in a small pond or you can swim in the ocean. <laughs> that puts it in perspective right there. That's wow. right. I like it. Isn't that something? <laughs> man? It's, hey, but there, there was a, there is a diff. what, well, was a difference between the two of them. It was different. <laughs> and what was the, what was it like your first grands when you went from the NBL to the, ABA USA BMX grants. Uh, again, I had one NBL kid, and I didn't make the main at the, at the ABA grants. <laughs> wow! Uh, I had, we had friends that would tell me like, oh, "You got to get out to the one. You got to see it. It's it's this. It's that. Oh, it's huge. Tulsa. It's this. Yeah, get there. Get there." When we finally did, I was like, "Wow, this was." I mean, it was always fun. NBL grants were always a ton of fun. But I was like, "Wow, this is way bigger." Yep. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Kind of piggybacking off that with talking about the President's Cup Christmas Classic in Louisville and Tulsa. Um, when you were racing, what was – you can give a couple examples or if there was just one. What was one of the nationals or tracks that you really looked forward to racing at? Um, I always loved the grants. Okay. And I'll tell you a few reasons why. Number one – I like that the track was neutral. Everybody just showed up, had the exact same amount of practice on it. 
And part of the game is, you know, dialing in a track in 40 minutes or 30 minutes or however long practice was, mm -hmm. and then you raced. And I felt like <clears throat> when you added in that neutrality, um, you know, it just really brought everything back to a level playing field. And then also, like, I always felt as if the Grands was the mentally the hardest race on earth from the perspective that you do your first moto at 7 a.m. and you run your main on Saturday night for the pro show, you run your main at 10 p.m. So you're racing eight laps throughout the day. The first one's at 7 a.m., the last one's at 10 p.m. And in the middle, you've got to warm up seven more times. Yeah, yeah. And you've got to go to Chipotle and get some lunch. <laughs> and it's, just, it's, it's such a mentally taxing, it's physically taxing, but it's just a mentally taxing day. Mm -hmm. um, so I really enjoyed uh, the mental like battles of the Grands. But then I also, uh, Sarasota was always a track that I really liked. They didn't have too many races there, but that was one of my favorite tracks. Um, off the top of my head, I, I, you know, there really wasn't one here in America that I loved. I mean, the world, all the World Cup stuff, I loved when we did the races in Chula Vista in San Diego. Those races were awesome, especially the night shows that they did in, in Chula Vista. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, honestly, I think I, there's something to like about every track, and there's also something not to like about every track. Like, mm -hmm. nothing, no track's ever perfect, you know, but the way I viewed it was, no matter what the track is, no matter what the weather is, at the end of the day, somebody's winning and somebody's getting paid. So if I'm going to be here, I might, I might try, try to make it me. I like it. 240 points for a win, regardless of go. what's going on, you know? So that somebody's getting 240 points today. Yeah. Are you still doing the co uh, the coaching in, uh, for the motocross racers? Yeah, I still help Christian out. Not, not as much this year as he's been hurting. Mm -hmm. And as far as the coaching goes, I don't, I don't tell him how to ride a motorcycle or whatever, mm -hmm. but just more on the mental side and just kind of being just somebody to talk to mm -hmm. and just to bounce ideas off of and perspectives and things like that. Now that's something that's been in that sport for a long time. Have in your time <clears throat> racing, how much of that has become vital in our sport of BMX? I would actually say our sport is, at least at the high level, at the Olympic level, mm -hmm. is further advanced than motocross. Well, okay. um, when you add the Olympics into the fold, then you add in all of the resources that the U.S. Olympic team has. Now, the U.S. Olympic team has an entire group of sports psychologists, sports scientists, dietitians, nutritionists, uh, strength and conditioning coaches, and just resources to try to produce medals. So when you're uh, a level one Olympic athlete, which is metal capable, you have the same resources that Michael Phelps has. And, you know, part of why the sport has advanced so much internationally on a global scale and why the rest of the world has caught, surpassed, and dropped the United States is because they have dedicated resources to producing Olympic athletes and Olympic medals. Mm -hmm. And those are the same resources that the track and field right our athletes get and the basketball players get and things like that. Um, so I, I watched working with a sports psychologist being rare when I started as a pro to now pretty much all of the top athletes from around the world work with a sports psychologist associated with their Olympic team. I, I don't know for a fact, but I would ballpark, that the vast majority of the international riders are working with their sports psychologists for their national team. Wow. So, so I did. You, you did. Okay. So would you say, and th this might be a, a silly question, but would you say that the United States athletes are not taking advantage of all that stuff? Whereas some of the other athletes from the other countries are taking big time advantage of those type of things. I don't know because I don't know what a lot of the current athletes are doing. Um, mm. So I can't comment on that. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. You know, do I think that everybody's using every resource available to them? Probably not. Um, you know, and it's, a, it's maybe they just don't know that the resources are available to them. Mm -hmm. um, right. Or maybe they just think that they've got it figured out and they don't need to ask for help. Um I don't know what the answer to that is. 
I've got a lot of thoughts on why the U S is where it's at, but I don't, I don't think it starts with that. I think it starts at a much, much younger age and the development or lack thereof on the U S side that the rest of the world is doing. All right. It's a great, this great transition here. Uh, first we want to do, uh, our chat check in and then we want to kind of expand on that real quick, Connor. And I know you, um, you've got limited time with us this evening and we appreciate you having the time you do and spending it with us. So we're going to jump in with Melissa real quick. Should do our chat check in. And when we come back, um, we want to actually talk about that and hear, uh, your views and opinions on that. Melissa, how's the chat going? Oh, it's busy, busy. We're going to welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in. And actually the, the last question that Wally put in, I think, kind of ties in there, too. So I'll save that one till the end. Um, all right. So, Connor, question from the chat. Nick DeSanti, otherwise known as Skyway Nick. You might know him. <laughs> His question is he's wondering if you would come back to racing if they eliminated the Supercross tracks and had elite pros just race on the standard national tracks everyone races on. Um, to be honest, no, really. Uh, I I feel satisfied with what I've done. I you know, raced at the highest levels for 12 years. I scratched the itch. I watch racing now, whether it's a Supercross hill or a normal hill, and I'm glad I'm on the couch. Like, I still enjoy <laughs> riding and flowing around and having fun, but the thought of doing six days a week of sprints and gym, yeah. you know, I've, just, I've done too much of that already. I'm good. <laughs> and um, your therapist, I do, thank I, you. I, I do have this idea. Um, and I, I've pitched it to people before to USA BMX, but I think it would be great to separate the two to give athletes the option. There's only four races a year that are held on the big hill. If they hold those races first, say February, March, and April, they've got the Supercross races. And then the rest of the year is just on normal hills. You could have two separate series. You could have the USA BMX Supercross series and the USA BMX Pro series. And international athletes who just wanted to do the, the big hill stuff could come over for a period, race the series before the World Cup starts. And then if you're older or you're not comfortable on the big hill, you could still be a pro and just race on the small hill. Um, you wouldn't change anything on the amateurs. They would be the exact same at these races. It would just change some of the organization of the, the national schedule and putting all the Supercross races first. And I think that that would be a perfect way to kind of split the two up and still give athletes who want to race but don't want to go down the big hill the opportunity to do that. That's interesting. Very mm-hmm. nice. I, I like that. All right. Yeah. Uh, oh, let's see what else I yeah, got. Yeah, no, no more sprints for me. I'm good. I'm going to drink So, oh, well, do you get out and still ride just for fun? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I enjoy riding. I, I, I ride my bike, um, all my bikes, whether it's road, mountain, or BMX. You know, I always enjoy riding. Um, you know, for me now, it's fun just to flow through a rhythm section or a second straight and get to the point where I feel like I'm going fast enough or maybe I feel a little bit nervous, and then I just hang out there. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> but it, it off every time. You just right. walk into the edge. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Uh I'm going to say this name probably wrong, but Akio Turner uh, wants to know how many hours per day did you train at the peak of your career? Um, It's going to be different always based on what's going on. So if it's preseason, if it's December, January, February, it's going to be a lot more than if it's in July, August, when you're in the middle of racing, you know, a bunch of races and rest is going to be more of a priority. Uh, I would say I typically would train five to six days a week of those days. Three or four of them would be double days where it'd be like sprints in the morning, gym in the afternoon, or sprints in the morning, gates in the afternoon or something like that. Uh, but I would say, you know, anywhere from two to seven hours uh, a day, five to six days a week. But like we were talking about earlier, you know, it's a 24 hour a day job. You know, mm-hmm. it's what time are you going to bed? What are you eating for breakfast? Are you hydrating? Are you doing your stretches? Are you getting massages? Are you going to the chiropractor? Are you taking the proper supplements? I mean, it it never ends. You know, it doesn't uh-huh. end just because you are, are home from the gym. What you do at home counts too. So then one, one follow-up question to that too, same individual. If you could only do one drill to, cha- to train, sorry, what would it be? Uh, well, first and foremost, it'd be the track. Like, there's nothing more important than the track. Um, 
but I don't know if that counts uh, for this particular thing. But I would say sprints. Sprints are by far the number one most important thing that you can do. Um, and you can do things with sprints to work different aspects of, uh, of your sprint. So, for example, you can put a harder gear on and it becomes a strength exercise. You know, I, I was doing sprints at, you know, towards the end of my career with 90-inch rollouts. Um, you could do sprints with small gears to work on your foot speed and explosiveness, you know, drop or not drop, but put a couple cogs up. So 44, 18, 44, 19, do some sprints on that. You'll get the legs moving. And so you could really work different aspects of your, of the race, just purely with sprints. That's a great oh, that's suggestion. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, okay. So then to kind of tie back into what we were going to start talking about before we did the chat check-in, uh, Wally said at a local level, what change would you suggest to retain and progress riders? It's a great question. Um, I think that the number one thing to retain, right, I guess it'd be different. So retaining is different than progressing, but from a retainment perspective, people need to feel welcome, right? A lot of times people's uh, perspective or their experience at the BMX track relies on the first couple of people they meet. If they meet some really nice welcoming people or the track operator at that track is one of the, one of the good ones who's really nice and welcoming and makes people feel part of a community, then they have a positive association and they have a great experience. Um, but I've seen it on the other side too, where the first person you meet might be a hustler trying to sell you one of the, you know, buy your way onto this team type situations. Mm -hmm. Um, and those people might have a negative experience. So from a retention perspective, I think it's, if they could, if, if someone could figure out a way to build that community at their local program, um, and this is just an individual track by track basis, but if you could build that community to where everybody shows up and everybody is welcoming to the new ride, nobody's making fun of their bike. Nobody is giving them a hard time and everybody's just being really welcoming and saying, Hey, nice to meet you. Why don't you come sit with us? You know, or, Hey, come here. Let me show you how to do this at the gate. Let me show you how to balance. You know, mm -hmm. that's going right. to help people have a positive experience and want to stay rather than making fun of somebody body because they're riding a you know dirt jump or mm -hmm. whatever it may be um and then for progression i think you know so, and again some tracks have this and other, other tracks maybe just don't have the ability to but coaching is huge whether it's a, a local older expert rider or a retired rider but somebody who's doing a weekly class to or a bi-weekly class to help riders learn rather than just going out to the track and aimlessly riding or doing first rates over and over again, but going out there just spending a day working nothing but turns. And then the next week working nothing but manuals and the next week working nothing but jumps and breaking the, the race down piece by piece, but doing it in a way where it's like community and it's fun and everybody's pushing each other and everybody's riding together. And that's something that I think freestyle is really good at. If you go to a skate park, everybody's you know high-fiving each other and progression uh, helping push the progression somebody does a cool trick and everybody's stoked for that right where right. where it's like a community of everybody trying to get to that next level and i think bmx can learn from that and that's what the the french do better than anyone in the world is they ride together their coaches progress the riders they've got a different system at the club level um where they focus more on group coaching and, and riding versus racing a bunch at the local level. And you're seeing it in in having five guys in the main event at the Elite World Championships this year. Yeah. Wow. That's I, I like that too. You know, yeah. Be be friendly to the new guys. Did I have everything from the, the chat, Melissa? I uh, one more. Okay. Uh, Miss Riley Baumgartner wants to know Connor's thoughts on if you think the girls class should be separated like the boys classes by proficiency I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna assume that's what she means so I to be honest I'm not a huge expert on the way it works but from my understanding I believe that uh, boys and girls race as a novice and they until they win a certain amount and then the girls advance to the girls class is that correct Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then there's a girls yeah. expert as well, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's the girls expert, and then if they're novice, they're racing novice. I mean, I feel like that's kind of um, split already. You know, maybe they're looking for like a girls intermediate class, which mm-hmm. is in theory not a bad idea. But I think the issue would just be if there's enough riders to make that yeah. class yeah. No, at the local level, sure. at the state level. I mean, at the grands or something like that, I'm sure there is, but they can't. I'm, I'm sure it'd be a really tough thing for USA BMX to do to add special classes just for specific races. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. go against their entire uh, system that they have that makes all the motos and everything like that. Um, I don't know if it's an option, but maybe the middle ground is allowing females to race in the intermediate class as well before they go up to expert. That's good. That, you know, that that's probably not a Good bad option. idea, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Is it at least they're racing um, kids that are their same age versus, you know, having a, let's say, a 12 year old and then a 17 and a 20 year old girl all racing together? At least you would have a bunch of 12, 13 year olds racing together. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, under the younger ages, it doesn't, like, there's not as much difference between the younger ages as you do when you get to the older ages, right? Like, yeah. 15 year old 16 year old boys and girls sh- shouldn't be racing together but seven year olds it's not as big of a deal right right for sure mm. yeah did that uh to wrap up everything in chat Moza? yeah all right okay. well uh we're being uh cognitive connor's time and we've got a few moments left with connor um and we want to circle back to what we were talking about before we went into the chat check-in and you kind of touched a little bit on it on sort of the international level. How can the United States step back up and be back at that level? Um, you, you spoke to a few things, but if you could, could you kind of uh, expand on that for us? I've got to be careful here. Okay. <laughs> okay. That, that, that's fine. I, I have a lot of thoughts. Right. And, you know, I've raced all over the world. I've, I've raced European rounds, Australian rounds, South American rounds. I've seen it all. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, I, I've had people tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about when I <laughs> make a comment on this particular topic. What I will say is that, um, In the U.S., we run a completely different system than the rest of the world does. There are pros and cons to it. There are some great things about it, without mm-hmm. a doubt. Um, however, if the if the ultimate goal is to produce riders to be competitive on the international standard at World Cup, World Championships, and Olympics, the system that we are using is not giving riders the best possible chance. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we are the only country that at the higher ages doesn't do gate picks. They just do the motor sheets. So for a lot of these junior elites and U23 riders, the first time that they're, or not even just those riders, the age group riders, 13, 14, 15 year olds. The first time they're doing gate selection is at the world championships. So they have no experience with strategizing, figuring out how to pick a gate. They have no experience with gate selection process period where in, in, in the elite levels, it goes off of lap time, mm-hmm. right? What play, what, what gate position you have, but it 14 year old boys at the world. If you win your first semi, you get first gate pick. So they're trying really hard to win every single race throughout the day to give themselves first gate selection or an early gate selection, where in the U.S. you could get fourth place in your quarter, fourth place in your semi, and get lane one in the main. Or you could get first in your quarter, first in your semi, and be in lane eight in the main. And it's just a randomized, Mm -hmm. which, you know, there's pros and cons to it. It's random. Everybody's got an equal chance. But if the goal is to prepare the athletes to be competitive on the world stage, it's a huge thing that they're missing. Yeah, I, I can see that mentally would mess with you, you know, like, oh, my gosh, should I pick lane one or two or five? I don't know. 100%. And yeah. you just don't have the experience. because yeah. and There's ne- never like a uh, – I mean, if you win, it's the right answer. But, yeah. you know, you just have to have that experience of making some mistakes, making some bad decisions with your choice to do it. 
you know, and with that being said too, and this is but this is where I run the risk of opening a can of worms. The U.S. has the easiest tracks in the world. <laughs> you just they have the easiest tracks in the world. You just answered about fifteen people in the chat <laughs> with that very same question. For sure, yeah. and, and 100%. I mean, I understand. I get it. I've been around. I understand that you don't want to scare the six-year-old beginner away. Mm -hmm. I get it. Okay. You know, I understand that you don't want to build these tracks so big and so gnarly that nobody wants to come ride them and they go to the other track in the, in the city or the other track in the area because it's smaller and safer and people want to ride it. I understand that. But objectively, the United States has the easiest tracks in the world. Canada has more advanced, crazier tracks than the U.S. has. Australia, mm -hmm. New Zealand, all of Europe does. So when you watch the riders in Scotland and you see the size of that track, it is visibly obvious that that track is more technical than anything that we have here. Yeah. That, and, yeah. you know, that's what they ride all the time from the time they're six years old to the time that they're turning pro, where here in the U.S. they're riding at the South Point. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, like the South Point's not prepping you to be an Olympic champion. Um, okay. And yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Hey, really, I get it. I really, I understand it. Like, yeah. I get both sides of that argument. But if we're talking just from a performance-based perspective right now, and this is really weird and hard for me to say, but if you're a 14 year old and money is not an object, and your goal is to be an Olympic athlete, I would tell you to move to Europe. Yeah. Wow. I, I can was, see that though. Back in the day, it was the other way around. You came here. Yep. I totally and, understand and, it. Like, but who, do you know who moved back to Europe last year? Uh, didn't Joris? Joris. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> hey, uh, real quick, I want to I want to squeeze this in because this was one of the coolest races I watched you in, and that was the Red Bull Revolution. Um, yeah. We, do we need more events like that? I, I mean, absolutely. I yes. think that there's All right. you know. Not everybody wants to be an Olympic athlete. Not everybody wants to put in that work. Not everybody wants to be a robot. And mm -hmm. that's okay. I think that there should be other alternative options to just being an Olympic athlete. And if there were more kind of fun, unique events like that, people could sustain, you know, a, a career and mm -hmm. be a professional and ride for fun. I mean, there's a, a, a ton of, of riders that come to mind that would – crush that and just have a good, have a good time. And ultimately there's a gate and there's a, there's a ramp. So the guys who squat and sprint and have the pool are going to get out in front, but it, it was a really fun event. And I wish there was more stuff like that. I, I gotta be honest, but and I've got a few more minutes. I don't have to jump. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah, I probably got a few more minutes, you just, just let us know and uh, we'll wrap. I, I don't, yeah. uh, we appreciate your time. That was one of my favorite events in my entire career. Like it was just so much fun. They took such good care of us at the event, you know, made us really feel like we were there to have a good time. And then there was a little bit of racing on the side and, you know, the, the crowd was into it. They didn't know anything about BMX, but they yeah. just liked the spectacle of it. You know, they had good music playing. Um, they had organized uh, a boat the night before that took all the athletes around Berlin, like on the river. And we all went out in the boat the night before, you know, it was all put together by Red Bull. Um, you know, we showed up, we had welcome bags in our room with like our number plate and our information, but it had like jackets and hats and like just, you know, little things like that, that were made you feel welcomed and cool. Um, and then they had organized a really cool after party and it was, it was one of the coolest events. Nice. We had. Uh, what was, so, so what it was, was more of an event than a race. Exactly. That's yeah, it was an event. Saying, yeah. 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 yeah, that's sweet. What was it like when you showed up and saw that track the first time? What did you think? I was terrified. I was absolutely <laughs> Bro, terrified. That step up was what? I mean, video did it no justice. Yeah, then, I bet. You know, it was one of those things, though, that, like, you're out there with everybody else, and you didn't want to be the one rider who was scared to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, nobody wanted to be first. Everybody was just sitting around like, all right, who's going first? Who's doing it? Who's doing it? <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a cool one because everybody was like kind of helping each other out. Like they would go do it and then they would report back like, oh, well, the lift does this and then just watch the landing here. 
Whereas, like, you go to a normal World Cup event or whatever, and nobody's talking to anybody. <laughs> so going to give anybody any help. But yeah. there, everybody was pretty friendly. Yeah, it's like the kind of that skate park vibe you talked about earlier in freestyle. Yeah, that was totally. a- that's that's what it reminded me of a lot. Is everybody was just jamming. Yeah, and you know, I think there was a few people that were taking it serious. I think the Red Bull athletes wanted to take it serious to to do a good job, and then and me as a monster athlete, I wanted to do a good job and kind of. Uh, Red Bull passed me over. They uh, they were going to sponsor me, and then they backed out at the last minute. So I wanted to to prove a point. So I took it seriously too. <laughs> sure. Um, what's up? No, no, it's cool. But yeah, so but it was it was it was fun. I mean, but it was one of those things. Like, I'm I'm pretty sure I remember on Instagram I put a selfie of me and Tori and I took a selfie right before the semis or something. Like yeah. I would never do that at a normal race, but we were just having a good time. It was. Uh... When I think back about it, it as one of the one of the few races, if you know, just the two years of it was when I know at the first one we were out at the track and we we're having a practice or racing or something, and they actually held the practice up for the race because we were all gathered around whoever had the best internet signal to watch it on their on their tablet or phone, mm-hmm. and we, we were out at Lansing and we were like, wait, wait, nope, we're watching this because the final runs were coming up. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's wow. one of those events that love to see more of those like i know the tra does their thing but man the 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 the, that was a that was an event rare yeah that was a good one i i would love to see it come back again and uh, you could do some really creative stuff with that i wouldn't be surprised that the next time they had like fire pits people were jumping over (laughs) it's like a calmer version of hell track (laughs) yeah exactly Or more realistic version of Hell Track, maybe. Right. Oh, goodness. Oh, my gosh. Uh, was there That's anything sweet. that had popped in the chat, uh, Melissa, in the last few? Uh, no, I don't Okay. Think. All right. Oh, wondering. wait. No, no, no. You're, there might have been. Hold on. Okay. Something's jumping uh, in. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Of course, I was so. off of it. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Danny Panay wanted to know what was your favorite race memory and your biggest regret? Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, the, the first one's easier. My, my favorite memory winning the Olympics is obviously our top. Um, but for me, my, my favorite memory of that was seeing my dad right afterwards, um, you know, and just everything that we'd gone through my whole life, you know, with all the hours that he drove me to practice, all the times, you know, he – worked on my bike in the garage when I was a kid, you know, all the times where I look back now and I realize maybe he didn't want to spend five nights a week sitting in the dusty BMX track, but he did it because he knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, right. You know, and just being able to share that moment. I mean, that's pretty hard to top. Um, <laughs> you know, and then uh, there's obviously a bunch of other ones as well, but that one takes mm-hmm. the cake. And then as far as regrets, you know, really the way that I would look at it is that everything that happened throughout my career ended up teaching me something and I learned something from it. So, you know, I wouldn't want to change it because then it might change what happened after that. But if I had a guarantee that it wouldn't change anything else, I could just change one thing. Obviously, Tokyo, that's the easy answer. But if I take that out, Right. Sure. 2014, um, when I was winning and Sam went under me in the turn and, and put me down in that second turn. Um, that one hurt because that's the only one that I didn't win. I won everything it's possible to win except for that one. And I was so close. I was halfway oh. there. So if I could <laughs> do that, one, I would complete the set and wow. have everything possible. Okay. Wow. Oh, one wonderful else. answer, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I can't imagine being your dad. <laughs> <laughs> and being on the side of that. You know, I have a daughter, but just like thinking about it. Because like you said, all the time, you know, we kind of take that for granted. All the time that, that they spent and the money and all yeah. that stuff. But to like f- finally see that come to fruition, I mean, you must have been overwhelmed with emotion. Yeah, well, and, and I don't think you get it as a kid. I don't think it's fair to expect a kid to understand no, that. No, absolutely um, not. You know, and even as I get older now, I'm 30. I was 23 in Rio when I when I did that. But 
even now at 30, I have a, a deeper understanding of the level of commitment and the, the sacrifices that my family made to give me the opportunities that I had. But for me, it was really like the ultimate way to say thank you. Mm -hmm. um, not just to my family, but to everybody, to everybody who was a part of the journey. You know, they, they, they had a piece in reaching the ultimate prize. And, you know, I don't think anybody can have any regret now because we all got the, we all got the, the ultimate in the end. Um, yeah. So it was, it was really cool. That, that is that is some cool stuff man you're 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 the only person from the united states to win the gold medal for bmx racing that is awesome yeah that's quite an achievement it is <laughs> and a tribute to your family and friends <laughs> yeah you know, in, in that kind of the your, your point about you know sharing it with your family and stuff and all the sacrifice you know, that's one of the things we tell the, the kids, you know, if we're doing a clinic or the BMX racing league and that, you know, be respectful of your parents. You know, they're bringing you out here, taking their time, spending the money they worked for to buy that bike for you. Take care of that bike and clean it and mm -hmm. don't throw it on the ground in your helmet. Take care of your stuff. You know, that's, I mean, that's pretty respect, you know. Yeah, don't do what Chris does when he loses. He throws his bike, he whips his goggles around, <laughs> screams and hollers, tries to pull his pants off like he's a wrestler. Hey, uh, Connor, oh, do you, dude. do you have, um, do you have hob like a sport outside of, uh, bike riding that, that you like to do? Yeah. I mean, I love all bike riding, uh, mountain mm -hmm. bike road, BMX, like I said, I snowboard in the winter. I love snowboarding. Um, I, a buddy of mine and I play racquetball every week. You know, I love nice. racquetball. Right. Uh, to be honest, like when I was racing, I had to be so focused and I had to be on such a regimen that I didn't do much else. So over the past year and a half, once I got healthy, I've been doing all of it. I joined a rec league softball. I did an eight-week softball league. You know, I tried that <laughs> out. I mean, I'll do anything these days just because I'm young and healthy. I can enjoy it. Yeah. Um, but right now it's snowboarding and racquetball are the two that I'm enjoying. I love when that. you When you wow. were on the racquetball. softball league – uh did did the everyone on the team did they know uh you well, were no yeah, I think <laughs> that's my, cool my buddy that i i played with knew uh he was on the team and then he asked me if i want to play with him um but no i don't advertise it like if i'm in a public situation like, yeah, yeah. Um, i don't want to introduce myself to anything and you know <laughs> people ask what i do for work or whatever i'll tell them but yeah. i don't advertise it Race. And also, I was awful at softball. I was not good, <laughs> so I didn't want to advertise anything at all. That I was an Olympic athlete. So you're so you're saying you don't go to the grocery store wearing your gold medal? <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I, hate, actually, I hate bringing it places because you can't replace it, right? Like wow. I'm always like hesitant. Sure. If I travel with it, or I have to bring it somewhere. Like I won't let it leave my sight. Just yeah. because you know, what happens if I lose it or misplace it? Oh, you yeah. can't just go buy a new one. Ooh, you, so, can you imagine, Chris? <laughs> oh, gosh. I would. Hanging out at the softball field. You're playing against Connor's, feet, Connor's team, right? Yeah. They're out there on the field, and like somebody just whispers, like, you know that dude won a gold medal? I'm like, what the f Because I picture, <laughs> like. As I strike, as I strike as out. As he strikes out. <laughs> yeah. And he throws his bat and stomps off into the corner. <laughs> that's uh, that's awesome. Uh, Oh, and you're so, still uh, one thing I will say back to Chris. You were saying that he throws his stuff. This is another <laughs> one of my dad's favorite stories. I uh, when people ask me, I, I, I'll get asked occasionally, you know, what I what advice I would give to parents, and I think this is a good thing for me to leave before I sign off. What Perfect. Give to sure. parents. Um, you know, one thing that I'm very thankful for that my my parents did with me is they really really stressed on being a good person and working hard and, and being respectful to your teammates, to your competitors, shaking your competitor's hand and saying, good job or good luck, uh, treating your equipment with respect, wash your bike when you get home, you know, have good grades, things like that. And you know, there was one time I brought home a D I think in middle school, my dad made me pick a race on the calendar and cross it off. They said, if you ever go below a C again, you're going to cross another one off. Wow. And, you know, that I never did ever again on that one. Yeah. Um, I, but there was one race, I think it was 8X, is when I was riding for Bad Boys. And we didn't have like a big team deal or whatever. I think we got like 20% off helmets at the local <laughs> bike shop type deal. Um, 
I got motoed at a race and I threw my helmet when I got back to the tent. And it was on Saturday. My dad loaded my stuff up into the car. Uh, we were in California and uh, we drove home. He said, you're not racing tomorrow. You can't mistreat your equipment like that. Then I got home and he made me write an apology letter to my team manager for mistreating my equipment. Wow. And, uh, I never threw anything again nope. after that really. And no, nope. um, I think that that was one of the things I'm most thankful for that my parents did is they instilled just being a good person and respectful and you know, treating people and equipment with respect versus having to win every race or yelling at me because I didn't get nag one or whatever it was. Um, and that's one of the things I'm most thankful for. I love it. I like it. That, well, that is cool. We want to say thanks for your time. We appreciate it. You know, you got to jump off. And with that, I'm going to toss it over to you so you can give your thanks and your shout outs. And uh, from all of us here and everyone watching and listening and that's going to listen because we do the podcast version of this, too. We want to appreciate uh, say thank you again and appreciate your time. All right. Yes. Thank, thank you very much for your time. So with that, Chris, thank you guys. That was fun. Uh, we'll have to come on and, and do a part two down the road. All and, right. uh, Great. We'd love to have some, you. Uh, some stories or something. <laughs> sure. Perfect. Absolutely. You thank you, it. Connor. I'll get a hold of you. We'll line up another time and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more. All right. Awesome. Sounds good. Awesome. We'll see you guys yeah. next time. Bye. Right. Thank you so much. Bye, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. All right. With that, uh, I want to say thanks right. again to Connor. And uh, it was really awesome jumping was, on with us. Wow. That was cool, dude. <laughs> that think? was fun. Did pretty good. Didn't fanboy out. No, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you oh, too. Oh, bro. Let's, you. Uh, you know what? Let's jump over. And you want to do trivia or do you want us to do next week's? Uh, we can talk about next week's guest. Why, why don't we? Oh. I should what? ask the question first, and then I got some time for some answers. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that's that's what I asked the question, and then we can ch you chat. You know what we should do? What? Have the producer. Yeah, that's, that produce would probably the show? be the we'll best have the way producer to do produce it. the show. That would probably be the best, yes. Yeah. <laughs> producer, take it away. Yes. <laughs> that's me, I think. I don't know. Today, maybe. It's hard to say. Laura started school. We all had to get up early this morning, and oh, it's been a, a day. Um, all right, so to the winner, I have your uh, ATB sticker pack going out here, and there is a very coveted uh, pack of Danger Snacks in there. Mm. One of our show sponsors, and I also, from another show sponsor, have a uh, bombshell light blue T-shirt here going out to the winner. Um, all right, so the question is... Let me clear my chat here. It's a good one, too. <laughs> okay. I'll clear it out so I will know exactly who comes in first. Um, all right. So what was the name of the first team that Connor rode BMX for? Oh, man. The, like it. the name of the first team that Connor was riding for back when all he right. was a younger man. Well, the there answers go. are going in there. You know, um, <laughs> it's a good thing we do the auto posts for the uh, BMX Rocks. Um, yeah. Uh, chat question. Oh, because we never asked. <laughs> well, because we did. Well, I wanted to. I wanted to be well, hogging the kind of time he, so we his get the time most. Time was short. Yeah. Um, so uh, tonight's uh, question, and we've actually. Uh, I was getting the alerts, and they're they're already answering. Uh, was what racer had the best showing at this year's Worlds? So uh, this is not for just pro or elites uh, or, or U twenty threes yeah. juniors. It's amateur. Anyone who. What racer had the best showing at the world? So that's our chat question. Um, you guys can throw your answers in the chat. We'll fire them off. I know we're getting, of course, it's Tom Brady is not the answer for <laughs> Melissa's trivia question. Who was? Who that's do you think really had the, the best world showing, Chris? Well, I'm I'm gonna admit I haven't I wasn't paying that close attention to it. I had some stuff Def going on at home. Get out. Get, get out. I, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I would say Barry Nobles. I mean, I, I happened to catch that part of it. And I'm like, dude, it's pretty get her done. Pretty wild. He, he, you know, showed up. He uh, limited, uh, you know, as you yeah. said when he was on the show. It yeah. kind of, you know, last minute for him. Um, but yeah, I, I, man, there was there was a lot, and it was. Uh, it's yeah. hard because I feel like I'm kind of partial to the riders that i know that went and yeah i know right. their story and some of their performance that's it. like i would give a huge shout out to avery jones that's where i was headed and my other huge shout out would be to malia 
Um, Alvarez yep. as Alvarez, well. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, a world two she came home with. And Avery, you know, she was there. And yeah. she yeah. put it. I didn't see all her races, but I, I followed her mom. So yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Her her mom updates. was keeping everybody up, <laughs> yeah, up to date. And you know, and I just for me personally, reading Avery's follow up posts on her social media, yeah, have and I'm not a writer, so this is this is probably coming more from a parent side. Mm-hmm. But right. re- but reading her tell her story and what she learned from taking you know from being there and all the, you know, Connor said it tonight, right? You learn more from losing than from winning Mm -hmm. and i feel like that she's probably at that place like that really probably applies to her so i appreciate her sharing that and you know mom to mom jill i got you i know that was tough to not be there (laughs) right yeah 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 it was uh and and that was why it was such a good question right right because you got uh your local people in there like our our friend of the show from australia hunter he was over there racing and he um you know, like, uh, like Avery, you know, he made it into, through his semis and, you know, he, then he got to go to the humongous indoor track over there and he rode that track. His dad sent some videos and oh, I appreciate no. everybody so- sending pictures to me, uh, cause we're redoing the intro for the, um, for the show. And we're going to put those, uh, pictures in there of everybody that was over there that sent videos and pictures in, uh, to me, so we're well, gonna. And if Connor were still on, he probably would have said Joey Lito, right? Because of course, they, he was yeah. kind of coaching him, and you know, didn't That's... didn't go the way he wanted it to go. But he also put it out on the track. So kudos yeah. to everybody. It was yeah, it was shoot. good stuff. Yeah, so, um, it, it was. And it the was Frenchies just dominating <laughs> over there. Oh man! Whoo! Yeah, next was... time there's a Saturday Night Live show, you'll have lots of topics, won't you? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Do that oh, yeah. mixed open with mixed open. Or mixed yeah. open. Yeah, I apologize. Right. I'm combining shows. Well, we got sometimes it's Saturday. We've changed the name about 80 <laughs> times. I like mixed open. I think that's that describes it pretty well. Yeah, it's that you, know, was, you got you that guys all Rick. Op- open open con. You know, open conversation, open topics, br- well, bring and them. It, and it's kind of a combination of of styles, too, right? That's like true. Rick and Mike's show is different than what we do. And so when you kind of throw the yep. you guys together, it's and that's why we bring a shit show 101. That's and that's why we try to <laughs> we bring us we bring a guest uh, a host on, too, so we can get a little interview. And uh, then yeah. we get in and do the the, the topics and it kind of we come up with a loose I'll yeah. buy for it, and well, then it yeah. goes right off the rails. Uh, you want to let them know who's coming up next uh, next okay. week, Chris? So check this out next week, next Wednesday. Gary, I'm going to screw this up. Lynette. Laurent. La- yeah, you did. That was a <laughs> well, I, flashback, I bro. I see it. <laughs> Holy shit. You, we rode with him at Ray's. Ah, I know. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I uh, so Tracer will not share that. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm gonna have Tracer thing so, give me a hard time. It's gonna so. be a fun show. Another Vegas, uh, Vegas, yeah. another Vegas person. guy. Yeah. Yep, uh, like Connor and yeah. so well, Gary's and unique with a BMX history. Go ahead, you. you oh no, yeah, you're going right well, where I was. Yeah, going. with a BMX history, and then like we know him to be a stunt rider. Yeah, currently a stunt rider. Currently, yeah. yeah. So you know, you, you drive, you watch people in the motorcycle cages and the oh, making yeah. circles sphere. and stuff. Yeah, uh, that's it. probably Gary. Yeah. <laughs> and he's he's been on America's Got Talent, um, but he started out like it's like like doing freestyle, killing it on the freestyle side, then went into racing and dominating racing, and it's just been huh. uh, it's gonna yeah. be really fun. Yeah. It'll be yeah. a good show. Uh, so check that out next Wednesday night. That's right. Make sure you guys tune yeah. in. Yeah, and hey, while we have a second here, um, everybody, you know, if you're enjoying the show, you like the show, give us a thumbs up, give us a li- like the show, the post, your, the, whatever you're mm-hmm. watching right now, YouTube or Facebook, give us a like, please. We're, we're, and follow us on we're, YouTube. We're begging. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, we're only a few hundred away from being yeah. monetized on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, we need YouTube subscribers yeah. badly. Uh, Please subscribe. A couple of shout outs to your chat question. I see Skittles a couple times. Yeah. I see Barry. Um, do, do, do. Who else do I see? Um, Deegan Brown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, super cross right. Uh, Ava Corley. Mm-hmm. Uh, another Deegan vote. Young. Sean Day. Yep. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, Billy just said, I know Chris is a stunt reader. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to share that with the with the Thank world. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Thank you, Billy from Gate Nine. Yeah, right. Oh, uh, that'll make Mike Miranda happy. <laughs> I screwed up somebody's name. It's his favorite part. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, I do have a couple of winners actually. All right. All right. <laughs> Several got? winners. Well, the first person, the first official person in the chat with the correct answer was actually Tracer Finn, uh, and the answer is Bad Boys which was a local Las Vegas team that Connor had shared he was racing for. So, uh, Tracer, you and I will touch base on this prize pack. Um, a couple other shout-outs on correct answers. Martin Kennard, Sam Meek got it right. Jim Bosco got Sam. it right. Um, Robert Cardoza got it right. So, thank you guys for listening Shoot. and did, being present at the start of the show, if you didn't already know. <laughs> <laughs> did did anybody else, when he said bad boys, think Detroit Pistons? Uh, no. 1989? Probably anyone I in usually Michigan. do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I went, bad boys. I instantly <laughs> thought of the movie. I was like, oh, that, that's yes, yes. No yes. shocker Dude, and there. And I had the song, like the, the <laughs> bad boy, bad boy. Bad boy song when do? he said that. <laughs> then it, when, he, when, he, when he brought up uh, the Phantom on track team, I was like, dude, I remember those guys showing up at nationals and just cleaning the house. Yeah. I mean, that was such a stack that was, team. That was a little before my <clears throat> return, but yeah. I, I remember the team. Dude, Phantom on track. Yeah. The, Everyone of them that I think I think all of them that rode for that team went on to have just amazing careers. Yeah, I mean they were some of them were having amazing careers when they were when um, they were there. They were just man, yeah. <clears throat> they just they would just show up and show out and have a you know a smaller team and just clean house, man. <clears throat> well, I'm looking forward to Connor coming back because I know we didn't even get a chance to touch on it. He and I had kind of chit chatted about it a little bit in the pre show, but. Um, from a therapist perspective, I'm really kind of looking forward to discussing his recovery mm -hmm. post his Tokyo yeah, injury because that's a story. Yeah. That could probably be a show. Yeah. Just that, really. And, and I've actually seen him on a couple other podcasts where he's talked about it. And, and actually, it's interesting, and I guess this is maybe a therapist I, and hopefully he doesn't mind me saying, but like even from hearing him – conversate and answer questions and and his mannerisms and stuff from those earlier podcasts right after the injury when he was starting to get back into things to where he was at today mm -hmm. I, i'm sure it's an ever-evolving process but it's it's rather beyond impressive what he's overcome and for those of you that are new melissa is an oh. occupational <laughs> therapist <laughs> at, yes, at, yes, at the yes. university of michigan so that's what yes. he has an interest in it yeah. Well, right, and so I, at my role with him would have been very early on. So you think about those ICU moments when you're just coming out of a traumatic brain injury like that, where he's not, there's no orientation, there's no, he has no idea where he's at, there's no memory. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, I mean, just like trying to, I mean, he was, he was straight out of it for quite some time, um, and just the involvement of his injury. You mm -hmm. know, those injuries a lot of times you can come in looking bad and then it unfortunately it gets way worse because of the brain swelling right before it gets better mm -hmm. and that's the really scary moment so we we work with a lot of those patients just trying to keep them stimulated and you know talking with parents and trying to you know keep talking to them keep doing you know anyways so uh, i no, look forward to I get into that <laughs> I, I, I think actually i think a lot of people will find that uh you know concussion stuff interesting because sure. I mean, I, I personally, uh, one of my daughters, yes. well, both my daughters ride horses, but uh, the ones had uh, four concussions now from mm -hmm. horse riding. And uh, yeah, it's no it, joke. It is no joke, people. It is, you know, if you bang your head, even remotely think you might go get checked out at the hospital, please. <clears throat> well, you guys want to put a bow on it? Yep. I think so. All right. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. I got to go steer my kid away from wanting to pop to, tonight at 930 when we have school in the morning. <laughs> like, what the hell? Does she uh, forget she has to go again? <laughs> yeah. So, hey, again, everybody, thanks for joining mm -hmm. us tonight. Thank you to Connor Fields for stopping in and chatting with us. We will try and get him back on as soon as we can. Uh, please join us next week. And uh, God bless you. And I'll shoot over to Justin. 
uh, on behalf of everyone that's going to be tuning in and listening uh, again. Thanks to Connor for joining us this evening. And you guys uh, can make sure you can check us out on your favorite podcasts. Uh, we just got listed on like four or five more. So if you guys aren't listening anywhere, you get anywhere you can find a podcast, podcast. We're over there on there. You can even talk to Alexa and tell Alexa to play the latest episode and it will. Um, yeah. And with that, you guys, man, uh, good night. God bless. You stay classy, BMX.